Andrea Blackman, and uh, most of you know me in here. I don't really need this mic, but I'll, I'll do it because Clint is recording, um, and hopefully all of you are okay with us recording this event. Welcome to NPL's fall series to kick off our conversations at NPL. We've been very fortunate to have some great scholars be a part of this program. We actually were talking about a year ago today, we were here, and I think uh, Professor Hildreth and I were reminiscing on last year this time, what was going on in the country um, and what we were remembering at that time. So we are excited that each of you are here. Um, a few thank yous I would like to extend to our Library Foundation, our community partners, several of our higher ed partners are in this space. We thank Vanderbilt for joining in and partnering with us on this. We also have Fisk represented in the audience, Tennessee State University represented, and did I forget anybody? it? TSU, Fisk, and Vanderbilt. Thank you all for coming out today. Um, what our format will look like, we will spend about 40 minutes or so in conversation, both with Dr. Blaine and Dr. Bird, and they will be talking about Dr. Blaine's latest book and her work and her passion and how we got to this place where we are today. Afterwards, we will have Q&A, and it will give us a time to have an up-close and personal conversation with both of these academics on board. Um, I would like to say that Dr. Blaine's book, um, set the world on fire. It has been quoted as shining brightly on those neglected topics that society is afraid to talk about. So as you know, we at NPO, we are not afraid to talk about anything, Dr. Blaine, so please feel free. A little bit about our author today. Dr. Blaine is an award-winning historian of 20th century U.S. history and abroad. Um, she has spent a lot of time in her research interests include black internationalism, radical politics, and global feminism. Her book, Set the World on Fire, Black Nationalist Women and the Global Struggle for Freedom, examines how black nationalist women engaged in both national and global politics from the early 20th century to the 1960s. She is also one of the co-developers of the Charleston Syllabus, also, she'll talk a little bit, hopefully a little bit later about that. And she also is a co-author of the Trump Syllabus 2.0. Blaine is a recipient of various awards, including a 2014 Huggins Quarles Award or, um, that was given to her by the Organization of American Historians. She's a recipient of the 2016 William, William Appleman Williams Jr. Faculty Research Award from the Society of Historians of American Foreign Relations. Her work goes on and on as her accolades. She is current president of the African American Intellectual History Society. Her research has been featured on C-SPAN, CNN, Vice, and so forth, and journals throughout the country. Dr. Brandon Bird is an assistant professor um, of history at Vanderbilt University and an intellectual historian of the 19th and 20th century. He specializes in African American history and the African diaspora. So we are excited to have them both. And I should say that Dr. Blaine is also on staff, um, assistant professor at University of Pittsburgh, correct? And we were so praying that the weather and the hurricane didn't delay her, so we are excited. I'm not gonna take up any more time. Please join me one more time in welcoming our guests, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Bird. So first, I can't begin without uh, yeah, thanking the Nashville Public Library uh, Andrea for inviting me here to be in conversation uh, with a scholar, a friend that uh, I've long admired. Uh, I don't think I've ever told Keisha this, but the first time we met, we were uh, uh, competing for fellowship at uh, uh, another institution. And I remember after she gave her presentation, uh, two of us just looking at each other and knowing that we weren't gonna get it. Um, <laughs> She got it, long story short. Uh, so again, long admired uh, Keisha's work and it's just an absolute joy to uh, be up here in conversation with this uh, brilliant scholar about her incredible book, right? Pioneering book. Um, so on that note, uh, I, do, I use the word pioneering not uh, flippantly, right? That this is a book that had not been conceptualized before, had not been done. Uh, so I wonder if we can begin with you talking a bit about what your motivations were uh, for writing this. Uh, what drew you to uh, this topic to even see the possibility of this book? Thank you so much. And so before I even answer that question, I also want to reiterate 
Uh, my thanks uh, to Andrea. Uh, thank you to everyone here at the National Public Library. Thank you for bringing me here today. Uh, thank you all for coming out on this lovely day uh, to have this conversation. And thank you so much, uh, Brandon, for agreeing to moderate. Uh, I really appreciate your kind words. And I do want to say that uh, what struck me many years ago when the first time we met uh, was despite the fact that we were in a competitive setting, uh, that you were so gracious and um, really supportive of, of my work. And, and it's a testament that we've remained, uh, I think, in close contact and uh, as friends all of these years. So thank you uh, for everything you do. And thank you for your support. Uh, Set the World on Fire, I often tell people, uh, is a book that in many ways began um, while I was an undergrad at SUNY Binghamton. And at the time, of course, I had no idea that I would ever write a book. In fact, at the time, I was pretty sure I was going to simply take a couple of courses, meet general education requirements, and then I would go on to attend law school. As someone coming from a Caribbean background, it was made very clear to me that I could be a lawyer or a doctor. I had no interest in math or science, uh, and so I thought, well, I'll be a lawyer. There you have it. And and so all that is to say, I went, I took a couple of courses, and my intention was simply to meet basic requirements for graduation. Little did I know that I would sit in a class on global black social movements at the time, a class taught by Michael West. And, and if you know um, the field and, and the work on black internationalism, you know how crucial um, his scholarship has been and, and continue to be. And so at the time, I find myself uh, in this class uh, as a young college student uh, who simply uh, thought I had a clear sense of what I was going to do and, and where I was going to end up. And I'm in this class and I'm so mesmerized. I'm mesmerized by the books we're reading, the articles we're reading. It, it's just, it's, it turns out to be a life transformative exper experience for me. Uh, but one of the things that I notice in the process is that we're covering all of these amazing social movements uh, in the United States, the Caribbean, Latin America, um, on the African continent, really just throughout the globe. And I'm noticing how male dominated these narratives are. Um, and this is not a slight to Dr. West, who's an amazing um, scholar and professor, but it really represented, I think at the time, uh, the scholarship and the ways in which many of these stories had been told through this male dominated lens. And so even for a subject like the Garvey movement, one of the first books that I read on the subject uh, was a book um, by Tony Martin uh, entitled Race First. And it's a foundational book. I always recommend the book for anyone who wants to understand uh, Marcus Garvey and wants to understand the Universal Negro Improvement Association. But it's a book in which uh, women are for the most part sidelined. And when they do appear in the text, they appear uh, as helpmates, right? They appear as the first wife of Marcus Garvey, the second wife of Marcus Garvey. And even when uh, Martin in particular would go on to produce a text on Amy Ashwood Garvey, uh, he would produce a book that, provide, that ultimately tells her story largely through the eyes of Marcus Garvey. So yet again, men were dominating uh, the conversations and the, the narratives were being told through a very masculinist, male-dominated lens. That was something that I noticed uh, even then. And so I started asking questions. I wanted to know more about women's roles. I wanted to know, know more about how women shaped uh, black social movements in, in a global sense. And uh, Professor West encouraged me to write a paper on women in the Garvey movement at the time. And that paper led to an honors thesis on women in the Garvey movement. It led to uh, several early publications on the topic. And I just loved the topic and I wanted to know more. And I entered grad school saying, well, I'm going to write a book, um, or not even a book, but a dissertation at the time, on women in the Garvey movement. And so I set out to, to write this project. And as I started doing the research, the research took me in different directions. So it certainly led me to uh, many of the figures who I'll talk about today who were in the Garvey movement. But then it led me to uh, figures that I had not even uncovered before, women who came out of the Garvey movement, who went on to establish their own movements, who went on to engage in black nationalist politics. Uh, and, and in many ways, I had to really follow their lives, their stories, in, in order to conceptualize this project. And so I think um, the final pro uh, project, you know, product is certainly a testament. I mean, I think it's reflective 
of these women's uh, stories. I allowed them to guide the narrative in many ways, and that took me in different spaces, different places, and different time periods. And so Set the World on Fire is, is a book that has certainly been in the making for a while, and I'm thrilled to be able to sit here to talk about it today with you. So I heard one thing uh, that stood out to me as you were talking, that uh, uh, potentially it's one thing to identify um, the absence of stories and actors in, uh, in our history. Mm -hmm. And it's another thing then to, to execute that research mm -hmm. project. Uh, so I wonder if you could um, just to explain a bit more then about what this research process looked like. Uh, mm -hmm. What unique challenges perhaps there were in recovering the stories of women that had not figured into stories of black nationalism or black internationalism, uh, maybe even what discoveries um, mm -hmm. really stand out to you from your time in the archives. Uh, yeah, even what it was like to right. perhaps have to build an archive. Exactly. I think in the early um, phase of doing the research for the project, I remember sending out these emails to archivists and to librarians across um, the country and saying, well, I'm interested in, in writing this project. I'm interested in black women's activism. I'm interested in internationalism. Uh, do you have any collections that I might look at on black women's internationalism or something of that nature? And many people would respond and immediately say, no, we don't have any collections on black women's internationalism. And I, I figured out very quickly that I was asking the wrong question, right? And so I came back around and, and started to say, well, you know, do you have collections that might shed light on black women broadly uh, in this period, right, from maybe 1920 to 1960? Uh, uh, and, and that led to a couple of responses. Well, yes, we do have, you know, a collection on this particular activist or this particular organization. And so I started making a list of places where I would be able uh, to potentially visit. And, and one response in particular came uh, from Duke University and the archivist there said, well, we have an interesting collection about a black woman. I think it has something to do with her travels to Ethiopia or something. So it was just a black woman in Ethiopia. That's all she remembered. Uh, she didn't provide too much context, uh, but she says, here's a link, take a look at the finding aid and feel free to come and check it out. And, and so that's what I did. I ultimately went through the finding aid and I thought, well, this is interesting. And this, this woman turned out to be Mitty Maudlina Gordon. I thought, you know, who's this woman? I hadn't heard of her before. Uh, what's the connection to Ethiopia? Well, I might as well make a trip and just go check it out. And so that's what I did. I scheduled a visit, uh, first visit, just to spend a couple of days. And what I thought would be a couple of letters turned out to be so so much material that I'm still, that in so many ways, I'm still going through <laughs> the material, believe it or not, uh, because it ultimately was this amazing collection with a ton of letters and pamphlets and photos and, and news clippings all surrounding Midi Maudlina Gordon uh, and her activism through the peace movement of Ethiopia, which as I learned with time, had little to do with Ethiopia in, in, in many ways, and Ethiopia more so conceptually, the idea of Ethiopianism or race redemption ideas um, derived uh, from the Bible. Uh, but particularly the organization was one that was very interested uh, in, the, in the concept of black emigration of going uh, to Africa, in particular to Liberia. But that, for me, was an opening. What's fascinating, though, is that the collection that I was looking at was not a, the collection of Mitty Maudlina Gordon, it was actually a collection of a white supremacists. And so that was both um, fascinating but troubling because that, as a historian, I had to ask, well, what does it mean to, to tell these women's stories and to capture this particular movement and to do so through this particular lens? What does it mean um, that ultimately I, I don't have right, a, a collection directly from this particular woman or the women that she worked with and that I have to tell the story, um, you know, through all of these lenses. And so it meant being very careful how I read those letters. So I spent a lot of time reading performance theory and really thinking carefully about the ways in which um, Midi Maudlina Gordon might have said something and uh, to read between the lines, what did she really mean when she said X, Y, and Z to this white supremacist and, and how might her responses to his questions be circums circumscribed by the, the context in which they're communicating, not just along the lines of race, but also gender. And, and these are the kinds of questions that I started asking. But I started there and what I started to do was I just started making a long list of all the women who showed up in the documents. So who were the women? 
who showed up on the letterhead of uh, any letters communicating between Minnie Marlena Gordon and this white supremacist uh, by the name of Ernest uh, Sevier Cox. And then I started making a list of any woman who came up at all, right? any reference to someone that I could identify as a woman in the movement. And that led me to ultimately looking for clues. And so I thought, well, clearly, if um, there's some communication with a white supremacist in this context, I need to dig further for other white supremacists, and that's what I did. And then I found uh, connections to Theodore Bilbo, a white supremacist from Mississippi. So that led me to, Miss to, to head to Mississippi uh, to, to go through his uh, collections. And there I found more women and more. And, and it just kept growing and growing and growing. And part of what I needed to do was to try to contain it as much as possible so that I could ultimately tell a story that you're able to read and, and grasp, I think, the nuances without being overwhelmed, too, uh, with the wide array of activists that I could have possibly written about. Uh, so the, the research process, process was fascinating. I learned a lot. It was, it was difficult, but it required, I think, um, determination. I ultimately had to go uh, to visit dozens of archives to pull together pieces. And sometimes, as I explained in the book, there were questions that remain unanswered. You know, I talk about Celia Jane Allen, for example. I still don't know which part of Mississippi she was from, but I know she was, she was from Mississippi, and I, I was able to find uh, enough material to present it to the reader, uh, but there are still answers that I couldn't answer because, there are still questions, rather, I couldn't answer because the archives were limited in that sense. Mm -hmm. So I like to think that I know some things about black history. <laughs> Right, I would, I would like to think that. Uh, and yet, I had not heard of mm -hmm. several of these women, right? Uh, and through these limited archives, you draw out these very rich mm -hmm. details about their personal lives, about their political biographies. Uh, and it, it, there's a number of figures that uh, I would like to go to. Uh, well, perhaps uh, you could tell us a bit more about two that you just mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, Mitty Modlina Gordon and Celia Jane Allen. Mm -hmm. Mitty Modlina Gordon uh, is someone who, uh, as I mentioned previously, really uh, in so many ways started this project because I started going through um, her letters, and her letters particularly to a range of, of politicians. I mentioned um, Ernest Sevier Cox and also Theodore Bilbo. She was someone who, who wrote a lot, and, and to be, and let me explain what I mean. This, is, this part is, is, is important because, you know, Mitty Marlena Gordon is someone who, as I explained in the book, uh, had a third grade education. Uh, she did not write books. She, she did not write articles. Um, and, and so I couldn't necessarily find, you know, a newspaper column, you know, that would capture her black nationalist politics, those kinds of things. And she, she even struggled, struggled to write letters too, which of course you wouldn't know uh, if you go, if you just stop short of the archives with a ton of, of letters. And so when I first came across all these letters neatly typed on letterhead, um, I thought, oh, this is fascinating. She's writing all these letters. With time, I would come to learn that she was actually paying and, and working with secretaries who would write these letters on her behalf. And, and then I was able to compare those letters to the letters that, that she wrote by hand uh, when she was later uh, imprisoned for her political act, um, activism. And then you can see uh, the stark differences with the way that she would uh, explain or you know, spell words. You know, you, you, all of that was very clear. But the point is that this was someone who I describe in the book uh, as a working poor activist, someone who struggled to make ends meet, someone who didn't have a lot of formal education, but she was certainly committed to doing the work and she was someone who tried to come up with creative avenues to reach the people she wanted to reach and to get her message across. And so she used whatever tools possible. I talk about her as a street scholar, someone who stood on, on the corners, on the streets of Chicago, and just shouted and shouted uh, you know, loudly for people to know what she, had to, what she had to say about black life in the United States. And, and all of these mediums helped me to construct the story because then it meant that as I went through um, a range of records, including government files, for example, I was able to find people describing her, saying, oh, you know, this woman was standing on the side, you know, on the side of this particular street screaming about black folks needing to go back to Africa. Uh, and they would say, you know, this is what she had to say, or this is the way that she delivered the message. 
all of those were clues as building blocks that I could use to tell the story, to say, okay, well, this is what I imagine, right? This is the way I know what she looked like. I can talk about what she looked like. I can also talk about the way that she delivered her message based on what other people observed. Uh, and also, I could pull from these letters. I can pull from archival material. I can pull from uh, poems that other people wrote about her, which is fascinating. I came across these amazing poems, which I, some of which I include in the book, that other activists wrote about her. And so just pulling all of these threads together helped uh, to construct this narrative of an activist who didn't have many resources, didn't even have a whole lot of support, even within her community, because she was ultimately standing for a, a political um, perspective that was then and still is a minority opinion when it comes to black nationalist thought. And so she uh, was facing resistance from so many different levels, but she was committed uh, to the idea of not solely uh, black people uh, returning to Africa, uh, which for her was an important move, but also to the concept of internationalism and to the, to the idea that black people would only be liberated if they would forge alliances with other people of color across the globe. And these are the kinds of uh, messages that she espoused uh, during this period. Um, and certainly one of the key figures in the book. I'll, I'll mention briefly, and we can talk more too, um, about Celia Jane Allen, who's an activist who comes uh, you know, to black nationalist politics through Mitty Maudlina um, Gordon's uh, work through the peace movement of Ethiopia. And she, as I talk about in the third chapter, becomes an organizer in the state of Mississippi uh, during the 30s and 40s. Uh, so she's also someone who I had to construct her narrative, um, utilizing all of these different uh, primary sources to pull together to show uh, the way that she did her work in the community and, and to capture her ideas about race, about uh, black nationalist politics, about internationalism, and so on. Now, these women are theorists, mm -hmm. and not just activists, not just uh, you know, helpmates to a masculine struggle, mm -hmm. right? Which is an important distinction right. that you absolutely make clear here. So I wonder uh, what exactly was black nationalism to these women? Mm -hmm. What was pan-Africanism to these women? Mm -hmm. How did they envision black freedom? Absolutely. And so here's where I um, certainly start with the Garvey movement uh, as foundational for many of these women's uh, conception of, of black nationalist politics and black nationalist thought. Uh, generally speaking, what I try to do is, is trace black nationalism through several core uh, values or beliefs. And, and the first being um, black self-sufficiency, certainly uh, economic self-sufficiency for one, but also black political self-determination, which of course comes through with their emphasis on establishing a black nation state. Also to the vision of pan-Africanism, uh, one that you can also extend to black internationalism broadly, so not only forging alliances and seeing the links between the experiences of, of people of African descent, wherever they reside, but also uh, more broadly uh, people of color. Uh, in this period. Uh, and so these core tenets, uh, political, black political, political self-determination, black um, economic self-sufficiency, racial pride, um, African heritage, pan-Africanism, these are the core themes that help explain uh, how they're conceptualizing black nationalism. And then of course, black capitalism, which, which, is, which is perhaps the most crucial um, part of their politics that sets them apart from the, clearly the folks in, on the communist left, for example, uh, you know, black women uh, like Claudia Jones and others in the same period uh, who would, would not uh, you know, endorse, uh, they would not have endorsed a, a black capitalist uh, framework, but the women who I talk about do. And so they, they saw themselves as in opposition to um, women, black women on the communist left, particularly on this uh, concern of um, you know, capitalism versus a Marxist framework, but also too because women like Mitty Marlena Gordon and, and others uh, who I discuss in the book, ironically, they criticized um, black women on the communist left because they, they criticized their collaborations with white people, though ironically they were, you know, collaborating with white people too, just a different group of white people and clearly um, a controversial group as I talk about in particular uh, through the, the, the lens of white supremacists. Can we draw that last piece out just a little bit? Because uh, there's a great deal of idealism, right, mm -hmm. in 
the ideologies and the politics uh, of these women, right? To even uh, think about black liberation, the terms they do, and the era in which they do requires a great deal of hope and optimism in some ways, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but as you point out, there's a lot of pragmatism to their politics as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that shows up maybe in their interactions with folks like Cox and Bilbo, right? right? Uh, so how can we make sense of that? Yeah, this was a very difficult um, topic. And, you know, of course, I, I knew, having studied the history broadly, that there were so many different examples of black nationalists collaborating um, with white supremacists in different contexts. So clearly in the context of Garvey, we know about his sort of gestures to the KKK, or even uh, a little later with um, a figure like Malcolm X. So, so this is not new, uh, to be sure. But I think what's interesting, as you point out, is that in this context, many of these women saw their efforts to collaborate with someone like Theodore Bilbo or someone like Ernest Cox as a pragmatic move. Uh, and, and that's not simply my interpretation as a historian, but, but that's really out of their own words. And, and I was searching for the answer too, because I wanted to explain beyond just, okay, well, this is within a larger framework and it has happened before and it happens you know, since. It's, you know, it's an example of how people collaborate um, you know, for a range of interests and we could talk about how politics make uh, for strange bedfellows, all of that. But in this context, the, the black nationalist women who I spoke about, their belief, I mean, it, it, was, it, was, it was fairly simple, which is to say that if they believed that black immigration was a logical response to white supremacy, uh, and if black people needed to leave the United States to establish their own nation state uh, elsewhere, and particularly on the African continent, then they needed to have allies and supporters who would uh, fully endorse the vision of black people leaving the United States. Well, who would do so? White supremacists. Uh, it's not hard to convince a white supremacist um, to get on board with a movement for black folks to leave. I mean, clearly the, the motivations are very different. Um, but, but here's a, a sort of a moment in which uh, the two interests collided. And, and that's one thing to know. But also it's important to understand the context in which we're speaking. We're talking about a context in which um, clearly, you know, d yes, we know about, um, we know all of the gains uh, politically and, and technically speaking, yes, women um, were, were able to vote and to uh, be actively involved in formal politics, but that's not, that story isn't so simple for black women, right, as we know. And, and so these women were trying to engage in, in politics in, in informal ways and, and often through the individuals who they saw as most influential. So for example, uh, in the context of Mississippi, for an activist like Celia Jane Allen, who's trying to organize in the state of Mississippi uh, in the 30s and in the 40s, it makes sense to reach out to someone like Theodore Bilbo because you know, white supremacists or not, he at the time was very influential in the state of Mississippi and beyond, right? And so it was seen as a strategic move to ally with someone as that, even though clearly, as I talk about in the book, the alliances were, were problematic. It also led to several challenges. But I'll just emphasize one particular phrase which stuck out to me, um, and I think has stayed with me this whole time, was a correspondence uh, with Gordon and uh, one of her supporters who said, why are you forming collaborations with people who despise black people? Why are you even talking to people who have no regard for our lives? How could you see this as strategic? It doesn't make any sense. And she responds, well, first and foremost, you need to be careful what you put in writing, is what she responds, because letters often go astray, right? And so she's thinking about the ways in which uh, whatever is being documented could end up in the wrong hands. She said, but let me explain this to you. Uh, you know, when you have uh, to depend on the crocodile to get to the other side, like sometimes you're just going to have to pat, you know, the back, the back of the crocodile. So, so that was her way of saying, listen, I'm no fool. I understand who I'm dealing with here. I understand that he's a white supremacist. I get it. I know they're not, you know, supporting this movement because they think the world of us. That's clear. But you also need to understand who's... Uh, controlling things politically, right? And who are the people with the most influence in this context? And we're going to need them if we're actually going to attain our political goals. And let's play the game and let's do what we need to do until we get to the other side. So it was about 
focusing on the ends and not necessarily the means, which is clearly uh, up for uh, debate and, and, and argument because it, it, it led to a lot of problems internally as well as externally. But that was the vision, is that these alliances, as problematic as they may seem, uh, were needed, and, and to an extent, they were useful. And let me explain what I mean. So just as a quick example, it was only through or primarily through the alliance with uh, someone like Theodore Bilbo in particular, that uh, these women were able to see at least, uh, you know, the 1939 Greater Liberia Bill. And so that bill was introduced to Congress uh, in 39 by Theodore Bilbo, but that was the culmination of all of their efforts on the ground, right? It was about getting uh, to a place where, where we could at least discuss the potential of getting federal aid for people who wanted to leave the United States and establish a home elsewhere. Uh, that was a, ta a tangible example, right, of the ways in which the kinds of collaborations, as questionable as they were, um, ultimately pushed uh, the conversation forward and ultimately made it possible to have that conversation. It didn't work out. Uh, as you know, if you've read the book, um, sorry if I've spoiled it for you, if you haven't read the book, uh, it didn't work out. But what's interesting is, as I talk about in the book, right after that presentation uh, before Congress, and right after it sort of falls apart, Mitty Marlena Gordon in particular denounces the very person that she's been working with and collaborating all these years to get to that bill, right? Because it goes back to her point, is that you sort of work with people uh, for the time being until you get to what you need to accomplish. And when you realize that they're not quite effective or useful for your purposes, you drop them, you drop them and keep it moving. I mean, it was very ruthless uh, in the approach. But again, it goes back to what I talk about as a pragmatic form of activism. Mm -hmm. And now, you've mentioned Allen's work mm -hmm. specifically a couple of times now in Mississippi, uh, where she, she's getting thousands of signatures, right? Mm -hmm. And this is the Great Depression and World War II right. era, right? right. So how does this shift our understanding of black nationalism and even black internationalism? Right, well, you know, for one thing, oftentimes when we're talking about, I think just black history in general, the black freedom struggle, we, we spend so much emphasis, um, as we should, uh, on the great migration, right? And so we're often talking about people leaving the South and going to northern cities or going to the West. Uh, that's a crucial part of the story. We often don't talk about the people who, who make the move and decide to return. And Celia Jane Allen is a fascinating figure for this because for her, she leaves Mississippi, she goes to Chicago, and it's supposed to be a better life. And you know, things are, are supposed to be uh, flourishing and thriving. Why? Because at the very least, you've sort of escaped formalized segregation. You, you've escaped uh, Jim Crow. Uh, and, and the vision is that, of course, there are more opportunities uh, in a place like Chicago in this period. And they certainly were, but the point is that some of the same challenges remained. And for her, it was important to not stay in Chicago, but to go back to Mississippi for the people who stayed. Uh, because again, we also don't talk a lot about the people who stayed. Not everyone left, right? And there were people there um, in the South. And Sylla Jane Allen wanted to go back to organize, particularly black sharecroppers. And so she goes back. And the way that she's able to do this is to stay under the radar. Um, and to stay under the radar to, to, really, to such an extent that I struggled to find her. And it wasn't just that I struggled to find her, but I chuckle about this too. In the process of doing research, I came across letters uh, between FBI agents who were like, we're struggling to find her. And I was like, okay, great, so I don't feel so bad. It's clearly uh, intentional here that she's working so diligently to hide uh, her cover, so to speak, and to, and to remain uh, behind the scenes so that her work would be effective. But one of the things that she does, and one of the ways that she's successful is that she really, you know, she, she goes back to the South and she doesn't organize with, with a whole bunch of fanfare, right? So that is to say, um, there are no documented speeches of Celia Jane Allen standing before crowds, speaking, you know, boldly about the importance of black nationalist politics. You, you don't find that. But what you do find are people recounting the stories of how she showed up in someone's church, right? And waited until the end of the service to say, hi, I just want to, talk to you folks for a little bit. Let me talk to you about 
about Liberia. Let me talk to you about the peace movement of Ethiopia. Let me present to you an alternative. You don't have to stay here um, in the South. You don't have to stay under these conditions. You could actually join this movement and work toward um, improving our social and economic condition through this organization and through, um, really through black immigration. So she was doing those kinds of things or showing up at people's homes. And there are all these examples of how she would show up at someone's home. And because on the one hand, she's showing up because she's doing the sort of mentoring and the slow organizing, but, is she, but she's also showing up at people's homes because she has no place to stay. And, and that's an interesting concept too, like how she leaves Chicago, she goes to organize in Mississippi, but she doesn't even know where she's going to spend the night because she doesn't have the funds. I mean, this is someone, again, a working poor activist, She's not going to endorse, and she's relying on the kindness of strangers to let her stay for a day or two, during, during which time she's working to establish local chapters. And, and so all of that is happening behind the scenes, but the other important thing, too, is that it's happening, and it's happening uh, through the work of a black woman. When the FBI agents come to town, they're looking to round up the black men doing the work. You know, still Jane Allen, it's like, it's like who? Oh, yeah, some, some black woman, we don't, really, we don't really think she's all that important. And, and their mistake um, really is, was, or their oversight was for Celia Jane Allen's gain. So by the time they come around and realize, wait a minute, there's a woman who's been doing all this organizing um, while we were focusing on these select uh, male figures, it's too late because she's already skipped town. And it's, it's fascinating how I talk about in the book where the FBI agents show up at people's homes and they're like, you know, investigating and, and activists are like, Celia Jane Allen, never heard of her. I don't know who that is. I'm like, what? Well, actually, maybe I did hear her speak once, but I'm not really sure. I mean, and it's, and I talk about, um, you know, I was sort of chuckling through the process because it's clear that they know who she is. And there was one case where the FBI agents are showing this activist, like, look, you have all these letters. She's like, really? I don't write? I don't read? I don't, you know, I can't even comprehend this letters. Like, like, of course you've written these letters. Like, clearly you can write, you can read. Um, but I found it, um, I mean, I, I, I chuckled about it, but, it, but it really spoke to the ways in which uh, people were, you know, they were skillful, they were careful, they understood what they were up against, and they also understood the importance of, of really protecting right, these activists and, and keeping the movement going. And what made it, I think, so successful wasn't just the tenacity of someone like Celia Jane Allen, but really the community with, when she, with, you know, with which she operated and the people surrounding her who saw the value of her message and worked hard to protect her, uh, even uh, during a period of, like you said, such government uh, repression and intensity, uh, for sure. But, but that, that's one of the aspects that I think is so fascinating about this particular story regarding Alan. I've got a million more questions <laughs> that I could ask about this that I want to, right. but... Uh, it would be a shame if I did not ask about your public scholarship, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because we are talking here about a book that I think all y'all who have read it would agree is written in incredibly accessible language. It packs very rich uh, theory in a way that, uh, thankfully, I can assign to undergraduates <laughs> you know, uh, that we can bring into the classroom, that we can bring into any number of venues. Uh, so. That seems very intentional, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so I wonder how you see your role as a public scholar, how this book relates to the work that you've done with uh, Black Perspectives, the award-winning mm -hmm. blog of the African American Intellectual History Society, with your writings in the Huffington Post, with the Charleston Syllabus. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, this is really um, an amazing thing to talk about because I remember uh, in 2014, which isn't that long ago, but um, I remember receiving an email from uh, Chris Cameron, as we, we both know our colleague uh, from AIHS, uh, the African American Intellectual uh, History Society, and he sent me a note uh, saying that he had this really great idea to establish this blog, and uh, it would, the focus would be on black thought, and, and people would have an opportunity to write, he wanted me to participate. And at the time, I was, I was finishing up the dissertation, and I remember thinking, blogging? Like, no, like, who blogs, you know? I, um, and I just, you know, tossed it off, like, oh, no, I'm a serious scholar, and I write journal articles. You know, that was, it was a terrible framework, but believe it or not, many people still hold on to this. And, and at the time, I thought, no, you know, I'm, I'm busy, I'm doing important work right now, and, you know, I'll check it out another time. And he came back around a couple months later, like, can you please just, you know, write one piece? 
I said, all right, fine, I'll, I'll write this one piece so he'll stop asking me to write a piece. Um, but I wasn't quite sure what would come of it. At the time, I had read a really great novel, Americana. I'm sure many of you have encountered it. And, and I was, as you know, already working, with, um, working on black uh, internationalism, black nationalist politics. And I, I wrote a short piece about the novel through the, through the lens of black internationalism and sent it to him, published the piece. I uh, didn't think too much about the piece until I started getting a barrage of emails about the piece. And I thought, well, people are reading this. Uh, but people were, were reading and they had questions about the piece. They wanted to discuss the piece. And all of these interesting opportunities uh, came up where I could engage with people really beyond the four walls of the academy. And it, there was something amazing about writing a piece that, you know, in my mind, I thought, well, maybe this would make for a good journal article. I'll publish it in this venue, and maybe 20 people will read it. Who, you know, hooray. Uh, but, but then to be able to write it in a context and with someone who didn't, you know, even have a background in, in black history, uh, for example, could read it, could get something out of it, and could come back at me um, as a scholar and say, well, I still, I still have some more questions. Can you explain more? And I love that. And, and I just love the back and forth. I love the dialogue that came out of it. And I just thought, wow, this is really amazing. And so, and of course, Chris knew that. That's why he invited me um, to do it. And he came back around and said, well, so now will you write regularly for the blog? And I said, sure. And that's when I started. Little did I know that I would start as a writer and then uh, eventually become the senior editor. And so it's now interesting to be on the, the other end of it where I'm helping other writers and, 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 and writing, I still write, but I also, spend, I think, spend more time now helping writers uh, sharpen their pieces and, and make it even more effective. And that process changed uh, my entire thinking, and it, it got me to the place where, you know, I'm not suggesting that I don't write journal articles, I'm not interested in engaging with academics, I would never say that. But, but I would be honest to say that I so enjoy, uh, but, but find it so um, fulfilling and important to, to, to do the kind of work that extends far beyond the academy. And to me, that's the most rewarding. And, and also, I think there's just been so many opportunities for me to step out of um, the four walls, right, of academia, so to speak. And that happened with the Charleston syllabus, uh, which, you, uh, you know, which you mentioned. That was an opportunity where I could collaborate with other scholars to provide a public reading list uh, for, for anyone to learn more about the history of race, uh, racial violence, and racial violence in the United States and across the globe to better contextualize the unfortunate shooting uh, that took place in Charleston, South Carolina in, in 2015. Uh, and similarly, the Trump syllabus was also an opportunity right, to, to provide resources for general public. And so I've just been so committed to, to, to doing work that reaches the broadest possible audience. So when I was writing the book, you know, I was slashing it myself. I was, I was like, okay, this will not do. And I just, I remember writing it and being frustrated that parts of it I felt, was, you know, too long because that, you know, the, the blogging experience had emphasized in me, I think, the importance of being concise, uh, but also providing depth. And I wanted to make sure that it was the kind of book that academics could read and learn a lot from and, and enjoy, that's great. But more importantly, that it would be a book that anyone could read. And just as a more personal aspect, you know, I, I, oft, I often said that I wanted to write a book that my mom, um, you know, who, who in so many ways, you know, similar experience to, to Mindy Maudlin and Gordon, uh, someone who, who didn't have a, a lot of um, you know, formal education, that she could pick up the book and read it and learn a lot from it. And I've always said I would feel like a failure if my mother couldn't read my book. And um, I'm excited to know that she was able to, to pick it up and read it and enjoy it. Um, well, at least she said she enjoyed it, so hopefully that was the <laughs> truth. Uh, and so uh, I think for sure the blogging and the experience of blogging uh, just transformed my whole thinking, and now I try as much as possible to do work that would reach the widest possible audience, and it's exciting to be here to talk about it with you today. What's next? So many things. I think what's interesting uh, about the experience, once you've written one book, um, it's such a difficult experience, but once you go through it, you, you get really confident and think you could write several at a time. <laughs> it's it's a terrible, you know, so... I chuckle because I'm working on several things at once. Uh, but one of the books that I'm writing, uh, in many ways, uh, comes out of this book. In the process of writing about black nationalist uh, women's politics, uh, 
I came across so many fascinating examples of black women uh, involved in several grassroots um, you know, grassroots or, uh, organizations and grassroots movements for Afro-Asian solidarity. Women uh, thinking critically about the role of Japan and thinking about how uh, they could link their struggles to, um, you know, to the Japanese. And you're just very fascinating, uh, particularly in the 30s and 40s, uh, prior to uh, the Bandung Conference of 55 that we we emphasize as being so significant to this history, to this history. And so I'm writing a book that centers on Black women's engagements in Afro-Asian political movements uh, from the early uh, 20th century uh, through to uh, World War II, and that certainly comes out of this book. And then I'm trying to do a larger project that looks at uh, several black women um, theorists uh, throughout history uh, to think critically about how their ideas would help us understand the contemporary moment and help us move forward as a nation. And so I'm thinking about, for example, someone like Ida B. Wells and how her writings, um, uh, particularly in her work around lynching, can help us um, understand how we would uh, today tackle um, the systemic problem of police violence and brutality. So those are the two big projects I'm working on now, and hopefully I'll finish one of them <laughs> sooner than, than later. Thank you. Yeah. I think forces are mobilizing to <laughs> get some questions on the floor. If real quick though, we could just clap it up for Thank you. Thank you. And we'll throw it open to some questions. We have a mic. There's a mic. <laughs> well, first, thank you uh, both very much uh, for this opportunity to learn so much um, valuable information. But um, you talked about one concurrent movement that was happening that we, you know, learn about in history, um, the Great Migration. Also, I wanted to know uh, another layer of it when we think about uh, the African-American sororities that were being founded and kind of mobilizing in that moment. If you could just talk about um, what you think the biggest difference between um, those two types of movements were, especially if we're looking at um, like AKAs, Deltas, and those organizations who were um, working domestically um, in a similar fashion. Mm -hmm. for the betterment of uh, black people. Absolutely, I think one of the um, profound differences, at least in the context of the women who I write about, is that they didn't have many, I mean I mentioned earlier that they didn't have a lot of support, but also um, in many ways they were lacking the kind of formal structures. So that is to say they didn't have the support of um, a particular institution, whether we're talking about a college or university, uh, for example, or even a mainstream um, a political organization. So I talk about the distinctions between uh, the women uh, who are involved uh, in the peace move movement of Ethiopia versus the women who are involved in the uh, NAACP. Huge difference uh, for sure in, in terms of the kinds of frameworks in which they're uh, operating, but also, um, I mean, that certainly leads to the question of resources but also too, I think um, the class aspect is important and I'm certainly not implying at all that um, the people who are involved uh, in sororities are you know, all representing a particular class, but I, but I think the class dimension is important to emphasize because at least for the women who I write about, they certainly saw themselves uh, positioned differently across, you know, at least along the lines of class when compared to um, you know, women in the club movement, for example, or you know, they would talk about the ways that, that they struggled to be part of the conversation about black politics in a, in, a, in a sort of formal mainstream stage. And what do I mean? Well, for example, people often say to me, well, why didn't the women who you write about, why didn't they connect with W.E.B. Du Bois, you know, which is a kind of way to say, you know, because of course, if they had collaborated with him, you know, they, would, they, would, they, would have, they wouldn't be absent in the, in the narrative, you know, they would be, you know, at the center of these important conversations. And then when I say, well, yeah, they did reach out to him and he didn't answer, and then I'm like, oh, you know. Um, and, and to be fair, Du Bois is very busy, he didn't answer everyone, so I'm not, you know, uh, implying anything there, but, but, but there is something to be said 
about operating on the margin, so to speak, right? It's something to be said about um, being involved in a movement where you, as I mentioned, you, you don't necessarily know where you're getting the funds from, you don't have the money. Many of the people who I write about in the book were on federal relief. Uh, so, so many of the people were also, you know, they were fighting enemies within and enemies without. I mean, it was just very difficult because they were espousing a kind of politics that, as I said, um, to this very day is one that remains a minority opinion. I think when I tell people that the UNIA still exists, you know, people say, well, you know, they don't, they don't believe me. I'm like, I, trust me, I, I've, met, I've met the activists, like the UNIA still exists. And, and, and it, as you know, and people get very upset when, you're, when you talk about the UNIA in the past tense only. Uh, but the reason why I think people imagine that it doesn't exist and that they imagine that black nationalism is somehow still not an important uh, you know, political ideology uh, is because many of these voices are, are muted by all these other voices, right? And, and at the time, uh, the kind of work that these women are doing, it was seen as you know, not, not the best way forward and activists, mainstream activists openly denounced the work of these women and to say that you know, this is wrongheaded we are fighting for liberation in the United States. We're fighting for equal rights. Looking to Africa is not the answer. And the fact that you're looking to Africa is the problem, you know? And obviously, uh, there are different perspectives on the matter. But, but those are some of the differences, I think, um, between the activists who I write about and the women who you emphasize as active in uh, sororities in this moment. Um, hi, my name is Brian Townsend. I'm a freshman at Fisk University. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a question. So as a historian, you will probably agree that uh, history tends to repeat itself. So I was wondering, do you believe that there will be a resurgence of black women and black nationalists except on a greater spectrum since time has passed and we have social media and a bigger outlet to speak? That's a great question. Uh, so on the matter of uh, resurgence of black women, I would say that honestly and truly, we've always, we've always been leading social movements and we haven't gone anywhere. Um, <laughs> I think probably you know what has changed is, is perhaps people recognizing that work. Maybe that's the big distinction. Um, I'll emphasize just briefly, you know, as I'm thinking about it, Black Lives Matter as a movement, a uh, very important movement um, of our lifetime, and and one that, despite the fact that oftentimes the representations are you know centered on. Um, black men, as we know, the founders of the movement, uh, you know, three strong black women, that certainly cannot be overlooked. But that's just as one example, right, of the ways in which black women, I mean, of course, even in the context of Me Too, Me Too movement um, is another uh, example of the crucial role that black women continue to play and have always played. I mean, part of what I argue, what I'm arguing in the book is, is that here you have a story, here you have a narrative of black nationalist politics in the United States that we generally tell through the lens of Marcus Garvey in the 1920s, and then a little later, maybe Robert F. Williams and, and Malcolm X and, and, and others in the 60s, uh, so on. And by centering black men, it, it ultimately sends the message that well, the movement was dormant, um, you know, post-Garvey, once Garvey is deported. Well, there you have it. We were just waiting around for Malcolm X to emerge, you know, and, and be the, the person and the voice for black nationalist politics. But if you center black women's activism, uh, you notice a very different story. And as I explained in the book, that moment that we look away and say, oh, there you have it. Uh, the movement has gone into decline is the very moment that women... Um, emerge uh, and you know as as key leaders and they are crucial for sustaining black nationalist politics and so we certainly wouldn't have a Malcolm X were it not for um, his mother for example right uh, who was uh, as many of us know uh, active in the UNIA in the Garvey movement uh, Louise Little and so all of these things I try to emphasize in the book is is less so uh, to the question of resurgence or you know, looking for the time when people will come back is to say, no, we've been doing this work uh, constantly and, and it's time to, to give us our due and to pay attention to the work that we've been doing as black women, um, not just in the, in the United States, but across the globe. Uh, to the topic of black nationalism, I think uh, what I would argue is that black nationalist thought continues to shape uh, contemporary po politics, um, black politics to be sure. I mentioned uh, Black Lives Matter. I think uh, if you look at the platform, 
um, for the Movement for Black Lives, you can see just laid out clearly some of the, the, you know, the key elements that I mentioned earlier about black political self-determination, all these, these threads and the emphasis on, on community control, like all of these things certainly do show the ways in which black nationalist thought continue to shape black politics. Um, only time will tell uh, whether or not we will uh, go to a place where we emphasize even more uh, black nationalist ideas uh, in public discourse, but, but I, I, I certainly think it's important to emphasize that none of these ideas have, have died off and, and these women's activism attested the fact that they worked tirelessly to ensure uh, that black nationalism would not die uh, in the United States or, or anywhere across the globe. Yeah, I have a question. Um, my question relates to classism and I guess uh, lifetime uh, commitment to being an activist from a woman's perspective. Uh, if you think of women who wrote the book, uh, they were talked about in the book, uh, Having Our Say, um, very prominent women in the 20s and they chose not to get married because marriage was almost like a noose, if you will. Do you think it still exists um, for women who are activists? Um, are you finding in some of the women you interviewed uh, family being a challenge or a compliment? Uh, that's one question. And then also, as an activist, uh, you know, if you think of your parents or your grandparents, you say, well, you're not going to make any money doing that. Why would you do that? You know, so you become a professor or you affiliate yourself with a foundation or some type of organization so you can eat. But what you really want to do goes beyond those institutions uh, so you can be a free, uh, abled human being and be as effective as you want to be. Um, you come across that doing your research? Well, so, so to the first point, my sense is that it's important to uh, recognize the fact that black women have not, I would say, had the luxury of having to choose um, between whether they would be engaged in political activism and or family life. I mean, I think about someone like Ida B. Wells, um, you know, who on many occasions had to bring, you know, bring her child with her um, when she was traveling or having to do uh, very difficult work. I mean, it's, you know, sometimes, I, 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 like I, I certainly understand the question. I think it's a valuable question about trying to find a balance, so to speak, and, you know, within these two realms. But, but I think for black women's politics, it's important uh, to see the ways in which black women have, have always have, have always had to, to balance the two and, and oftentimes didn't have a choice in the matter, especially, you know, you bring up classism you know, to have the, the opportunity or the privilege, so to speak, of um, maybe having a family where you didn't necessarily have to, to work because someone else um, contributed to the household expenses and, and you just, you know, kind of comfortable with, 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 with their, whatever their contributions are, um, or even that you could uh, pay someone to, to come to your home and, and look after your child. Like, th these are certain luxuries that, um, did not extend right to to everyone, and and I think black women have have always had to be um, careful to to balance the you know those two and to, to you know those two worlds so to speak, and, and not allow uh, you know as you're explaining it family obligations or even marriage if if one so chooses. Um, to, to come in the way of, of their political work. What I would say is in the context of the book, what I did notice uh, was that several of the women who I talk about were off, you know, often married to or had you know, partners or relationships with people who were involved in the same movements in which they were active, uh, which I think you know, might also just be uh, the, you know, possible because of the, you know, the fact that they were so committed to the work and these are the, the people that they were collaborating with for other reasons and, 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 and relationships sometimes uh, came out of those contexts. Uh, someone like Midi Maud, um, Lena Gordon uh, had, uh, you know, three children. What's interesting is, you know, as I, as I explained in the book, she didn't even talk about those children often, which I think um, was for her you know, could speak to the ways in which she was shielding her private life. She didn't talk a lot about what was happening uh, in, in her personal life. Uh, but, you know, but she was, she was a mother. 
a, a wife, uh, and, she was, and she was a political activist. And one of the things that come up is when she was imprisoned, I remember coming across a letter, her husband wrote a letter, and he says, you know, it's really hard for me right now because I can't even figure out where to find things around in the kitchen. And I, I remember thinking, wow, like, you know, how amazing this is. So you have this woman who's, I mean, at the forefront of black nationalist politics, I don't even know how she had time to do half of what she did. And, and yet, you know, she still has this, this, this spouse who was so reliant on her that he couldn't figure out where things were around the kitchen, which is clearly uh, speaks to the fact that she was also holding it down, right, at home in, in interesting ways. So, uh, so it's a complex, um, a question and kind of uh, balance, but but historically we've seen black women having to you know to, to balance both and to do so. Uh, remind me of the second point. Oh yes, institutions, institutions about um, people having to align themselves to institutions and take on responsibilities. What I think the only thing that I would say on that matter uh, is that it's important to to do the kind of work that you want to do, um, and, and I, I don't want to. I don't want to send the message that that the work that I do uh, as a professor and as a scholar and activist that it's being fully supported by everyone. Okay, I'm glad that I give off that veneer. Um, that's wonderful, but that's not the reality. The reality is that I still had people look at me and say, "Well, that's really nice that you're blogging. It's really great that you're writing op-eds." Um, and in fact, I had someone say to me concerning the Charleston syllabus, they're like, that's a really important project. It's great you wrote a book about it, but just so you know, it doesn't count because we really want to see a solo author. I mean, that's the kind of, and I'm thinking, why in the world are you having this conversation with me? I didn't, I didn't write it for tenure. And I surely didn't write it um, you know, for you to be telling me you know, what you're going to get out of it or not get out of it. Um, but that's important, you know, and you, these are the challenges that we face, you know, as, as scholars and, and activists, because unfortunately we're in a profession that sees those two things as different, which is strange to me, which I go back to black scholars yet again, was, was W.E. Du Bois a scholar and activist? That's not a question you would ask, right? I mean, he was both, and so many people were both, and it was never a question, and I've always you know, marveled at the fact that people imagine that we even have a choice in the matter. But in any case, all of that is to say that I think it's important to do the work um, that's important to you and to follow your convictions. Clearly you have bills to pay and you, you have um, maybe people relying on you and, and I get all of that. Uh, but we're certainly, I think as scholars in AI Trust, mindful of the fact that not everyone is fully on board with what we're doing and some people see it as a departure from our scholarship rather than very much aligned with our scholarship. And so, such is life. What, what can you do about it? I'm sorry, just that I wanted to thank you all so much for, um, for the illuminating talk and conversation. Um, my question has to do with that relationship uh, between activism and mental health, mm -hmm. especially for um, women and especially um, women of color. So can you speak to that at all in your studies as to whether that has come about or uh, ways that people have dealt with that issue within the community? Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a great question. I think um, today, for sure, this is a topic that I think is still one that people don't often want to talk about. I think there's still a stigma around um, mental illness um, today as there, were, uh, as there was a stigma um, in the 1930s or 1940s or, and, and beyond. And it didn't necessarily come up, I think, directly in some of the writings um, of the activists who I talk about in the book. But I do think that um, there are moments I, in the process of, of doing the research where I remember, and so we've been talking a lot about Gordon, and so I, I think about this example where Celia Jane Allen, there's a moment where she begins to criticize Gordon, and she says, you know, he, you know, I came to this movement um, committed to the cause of black liberation and I'm working with this activist. And she's pointing out all the ways that she sees what she describes as sort of irrational behavior, right? And, and, and certain things happening in the movement that, that causes a strain between her and, and Gordon. And she talks about Gordon 
um, becoming very suspicious of people and paranoid and, and all these things happening. And I, I remember thinking, huh, I wonder, if, I wonder if there's something more here, right, that I simply can't get to because of the limitations of the sources. But I also thought, too, well, imagine the context, right, in which these women are, are working, right? I mean, they're, they're organizing, uh, starting their work in, in, in the period of the Great Depression under financial constraints, under, you know, political constraints. You know, they're trying to do work and dodging the FBI and, and, and other people who are, who are looking um, to, to really to arrest them for the kind of work that they're doing. They're being criticized by other black activists um, who dismiss the kind of work that they're doing because it doesn't fall in line with mainstream ideas about black progress and all of that. Um, and at the same time, they don't have resources, they don't have uh, the kinds of financial support or other things that they need to move the work forward. And you think about what that, what that does, right? You think about what that does to a person, um, certainly what it does to the movement, but you think about the personal to uh, toll. And, and I remember um, just those glimpses in the archives, right, of, of women who would talk about just not being sure how they would, you know, pay their bills or, or not being sure how they, you know, where they would even live the next day, but, they, but they, they also had to remain committed to the work, right? Because the work was so important and they needed to um, advance, um, you know, in their mind, they, they really needed to, to advance the cause of black liberation and they had to sacrifice in many ways themselves and their health, which is another thing too, right? I mean, these women, oftentimes developing all kinds of um, you know, health issues that they couldn't even address because they didn't have the money again. Or, you know, so all of that is to say that I think even though the topic of mental illness did not necessarily, or mental health broadly, did not necessarily come up directly, I think one could see those, those clues, right, in the archives and the ways in which um, they show up, and it certainly speaks to the current moment. I mean, you know, we're at a time where people, we talk a lot about self-care, and I think sometimes pe people joke about it, like, oh yeah, self-care, I'll get a massage, or, you know, but it's not that. I think it's far more um, to the point of recognizing, recognizing one's limitations, um, but also recognizing when, when you need to talk to someone, recognizing when you need to ask for help, and we're, we're, we're in this moment where people feel the need to be everything and to do everything. And so I'm often, you know, I, I, I meet activists and scholars all the time who say to me, well, I'm frustrated because I'm involved in doing X, Y, and Z, but I feel like I should be doing more and I want to do something here in this country and that country and I, I'm overwhelmed and how do you balance it all? And I said, you know, I said, just do one thing and do one thing right. You know, do one thing and do one thing well. Um, and and don't, don't allow, I think, the pressures, the external pressures of other people to impose on you what your politics should look like or what your activism should look like. Uh, you know, for me, you know, I write. Um, writing is an important tool. You know, I do a whole lot, and there's some things I simply don't do um, because I can't, and I can't do it all. And I think that this 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 aspect is important to emphasize because I think when people do feel like the world is on their shoulder and they have to to do so much and to please so many people and to be so many things to many people and then they don't have the help that they need and the support that they need, it ultimately leads uh, to devastating consequences. So that's what I'll say on that matter. Thank you. Hello, I just wanted to say, uh, my, my name is Michael, and I want to say um, I appreciate the work that you're doing. Um, and I had a question in regards to a uh, feminism and the feminist movement, where are uh, black nationalist women? Mm -hmm. So black nationalist women, um, and, and particularly in this moment that I'm writing about, did not always align themselves with the feminist movement. In fact, one of the reasons, and so people have asked me sometimes, uh, in the book I talk about these women as proto-feminists because I emphasize what I see as a feminist consciousness, a kind of feminist sensibility. At the same time, I stop short of um, emphasizing these women as black feminists, well, for several reasons. For one, I want it to be true. I wanted to present the women as truthfully to the way they, they would have wanted themselves represented. I didn't find evidence of women even calling themselves black feminists. They call themselves black nationalists, for sure. They, they fully embrace that, even if there are differences in meanings of you know, what they meant by it. But they didn't call themselves feminists. What I did see, however, um, was, a, uh, was a feminist consciousness that I think 
resembled a lot of the activism and ideas that would later develop um, in the 60s, for example. And, and so that's why I emphasized, you know, that's why I labeled these women as proto-feminists, to, 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 not, to not overlook right, those, those ideas and those uh, activities uh, in the 20s and 30s and 40s and even um, 50s that, that clearly spoke to a kind of resistance to male chauvinism, you know, a resistance to patriarchy. The problem is that all that is happening at the same time that these women are also complicit too, as I talk about, right? And, and that they are, they're complicit to maintaining oftentimes masculinist um, visions of black liberation, even as they say that they're committed to expanding women's opportunities. So, so the matter of feminism is certainly complicated and complex. I think what is important to note is that these women did not sit idly by and allow men uh, necessarily to shove them to the side and, and take center stage they spoke up, and they spoke up, and they resisted, and they pushed back, uh, and, and sometimes they hesitated. Um, sometimes, you know, they went right for it. But the point is that I wanted to make sure that people did not see these women as sort of okay. Well, here's a group of women in you know patriarchal uh, movements who just sort of accepted it as is, and um, and didn't resist. Clearly, these women resisted, uh, even as they struggled to, I think maintain on the one hand a black nationalist framework which which very much which is very much masculinist uh, and then to an extent a kind of feminist uh, politics or feminist uh, consciousness that resisted those limitations as well so so you see both of these things happening in the book uh, throughout it and that's the best way that I think uh, one can describe black nationalist women's positioning to the feminist movement of this period Thanks. Um, firstly, thank you so much. Um, my name's Abina. I'm at Vanderbilt University, third year PhD student mm -hmm. in the history department. Um, I'm a 19th century historian. Um, so my question is, do you find that these women are situating themselves in any kind of heritage of thought? Um, do they talk about, how, how are they thinking historically mm -hmm. and situating their own concepts of nationalism mm -hmm. and even black womanhood? I'm just curious mm -hmm. about how they're situating themselves in mm -hmm. the longer kind of trajectory. Absolutely, and so um, lots of references in their writings to uh, someone like uh, Bishop Henry McNeil Turner, who as you know, um, from the 19th century context was certainly uh, a black nationalist thinker, um, Someone who was also very uh, interested in, 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 the, in, the, in, in the notion of, of um, black emigration. Um, and I think many of these women, especially those who um, grew out of, who, who came out of, of a context of the black church, broadly speaking, would point to Bishop Henry McNeil Turner as someone, uh, as an early influence uh, before uh, Marcus Garvey, of course. You know, the women didn't necessarily talk about Mariah Stewart, but I um, talk about Mariah Stewart in the book as being a, a significant uh, figure, along with David Walker, for thinking about the foundations of black nationalist thought, um, in the US in particular, and how these women were, were building and, and to an extent expanding upon these ideas. Someone like um, Booker T. Washington. So just an array, I mean, Edward Blyden, uh, Martin Delaney. Um, and I'm mentioning a lot of male figures, I, I recognize that. Uh, but I think part of, part of what's, what has happened too is that these women, at least even in the way that they talk about how they come to black nationalist thought, are often doing so by talking about the, the male theorists, right? Um, who shaped their ideas, so, so that was, that's part of what's happening here too. And, and, I, and I, you know, there's something else too, I don't know if, you, um, if you've read the book yet, but one of the things that I talk about in, in um, the last chapter was the way in which, even after all of what has taken place in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, I talk about this article um, that, that Amy Jacques Garvey writes, right, in the 1960s, and she's looking back and she's talking about black nationalist movements and how black nationalism has been sustained throughout history. And what does she do? She erases women um, from her consent. I mean, I just, oh, you know, I was like, here we go again. But, but, it, but again, it speaks to uh, what I think is still a problem uh, today of how these movements are, are framed 
uh, in such a in such a way that women, even even women activists themselves, are are guilty of um, of overlooking other women. And so I talk in the book about someone like um, Queen Mother Moore, who doesn't necessarily come up in the writings of these women, but certainly should, given. Um, her, I mean, the amazing work that she was doing, and and the really the decades of work that she was doing from Garvey's, I mean, you know, involved in the Communist Party, and um, so both black nationalists and the Communist left, and also internationalist kind of frameworks. All of these individuals are foundational. Whether these, whether the women I talk about acknowledge them or not, I think they should be acknowledged. So I have a question. Um again about feminism and the kind of the intersection with black nationalism it, it, and one of the questions I have is do you consider your work feminist and if so is that something that you would would openly is that a term you would openly use and also in thinking about just the history of um, black women and feminism as I interface with a lot of young younger college students, and I talk about, you know, bell hooks, you know, and Audre Lorde. And they, these are, these are young women who are taking, you know, African American studies courses. There's no concept, they're, they've never heard of. So I just wonder, hmm. you know, where, where is the role of the black woman in the feminist movement? And can you really, is there really a true public intersection between black nationalism and feminism? Mm -hmm. So in terms of whether or not I um, see my work as within the canon of black feminism, um, you know, I, I would say yes. I mean, it's part of what I try to do as a scholar, I mean, as a historian, and it is hard to be sure, I try as much as possible not to impose uh, necessarily my thinking, my framework, onto the, the subjects that I write about. And, and, and I understand that it's a very difficult thing to do because clearly we all have ideas about how things should be framed and, and explained. Uh, and and I, I said it at the beginning, and I'll emphasize it here, is that I, I determined very early that I wanted these women's voices to, to be dominant in the book, and I wanted their visions to guide the book and um, so much so that, I mean, I, at each revision, I tried as much as possible to, to tell the story the way that, that I think it would be uh, most appropriate to tell in light of what they were, the messages that they were trying to convey. When I first, when I wrote, I think, the first draft of the book, so to speak, um, it was very different than, the, than what you're reading in the final product because I, I really wanted more of of a robust kind of feminist um, emphasis. And, but part of what I needed to do, clearly as a writer, was I needed to, to provide the evidence of this. So I needed to go back to the women, to their writings, not just to, but not only to what they said, but what they did. And so that's what I try to do in the book. I say, well, these are the ways in which these women articulated a feminist politics, right? By going into communities, um, establishing their own organizations, by serving as leaders over both men and women, by pushing it back against uh, patriarchy and, and so on. And these are the examples. But I also, but I didn't want to, to take a leap um, to go so beyond the scope of what was clearly uh, in the archives, uh, simply because you know, I wanted to um, to do so. So that's that's the whole point of of, of my point earlier is, is trying to position them the way that they position themselves. And this is this is not how many scholars have chosen to do this. I and I acknowledge that in the book. I think probably the issue of feminism is one that is the most contested when it comes to Black nationalist women's politics. And we go you know we go back and forth. And there's you know I can mention three different terms. And you know we we, we get into uh, debates about what to call these women, I'm less interested in, in the labels and more so in just identifying the actions, the ideas. And so if you notice, I don't call them black radicals, but I talk about what's radical about their politics. So this is radical about their politics, this is conservative about their politics within the framework of conservatism at the time in which I'm speaking. Uh, this is feminist, this is not so feminist. Uh, and, and let people um, 
just work with that as opposed to um, letting the terms guide me. The only term that I knew could guide me that I could stand by was black nationalism because they stood by it. And they said, we are black nationalists. That is what we are. And so I tried to then tell uh, through that vision. Uh, what I will say um, as I conclude is that it is impossible to understand a history of feminism at all without centering black women. And I think anyone who's teaching a course on uh, US feminism um, need to be true to the history and they need to center black women. I think that's the problem right there, right? Um, so, you know, whether we want to start with Sojourner Truth, you know, I mean, we, I mentioned Mariah Stewart earlier. I mean, there's so many uh, foundational um, women who we have to center. And, the, the, and I, do, I know that they have not always been centered uh, in textbooks and uh, in course syllabi, but I think that is a problem of our own making and one that we definitely need to fix. And so I, I certainly hope that if nothing else, out of this conversation concerning the book and more broadly speaking, black feminist politics and black women's politics, that, that, that we would go back right to the history, uh, to the history of which black women have always been central to um, US politics and global politics and give them the recognition that they are due. So that's what I hope people will take from this. Thank you. Once again, on behalf of the Public Library, I would like to thank Dr. Keisha Ann Blaine and Dr. Brandon Bird. We appreciate you. And what I think is so, so amazing about our gathering and our conversation today is that this is not on an academic campus. And so I'm truly grateful that we can have these intersectional spaces that we can bring our public together. And as Dr. Blaine spoke, that everyday people can read her book. And let me just say, or you can check it out at your public library, but we have copies, right? So those of you who brought your books with you, um, to have Dr. Blaine sign them. I'm sure she'll be happy to do that. Those of you who still need to buy them, you know where you can buy them. And if you need to check them out, you can go right upstairs and check them out. Again, on behalf of the library, we thank you so much for your time. Thank you all. Thank you.